During the years between the formation of our country in 1776 through the end of the first decade of the 19th century, statehood had been granted to 17 states and several other territories were taking shape. After the Lewis and Clark expedition, the era of the mountain men began. These men were rough and hardy trappers, explorers, and map makers who set out to explore and roam the newly acquired Louisiana Territory, each revealing new geographic and scientific details about specific parts of the Western landscape. But this revealing process was not a simple one. New knowledge did not automatically replace old ideas. Some old notions about river passages across the West and the annual rendezvous in the wilderness, where fur traders and indigenous people would meet to exchange goods, persisted well into the 19th century. Countless numbers of North American beaver found in lakes, rivers, and ponds throughout the country attracted adventurous fortune seekers. More than any other natural resource, the North American beaver was responsible for the establishment of many settlements throughout the West. During the early 1800s, a good beaver pelt sold for an average of $7.50 in New York and London. It took about eight to nine pelts to make a good coat back then, which, in today's money, would cost you between $14 and $1,600. Equally impressive were the American bison, or buffalo. These gentle giants were as thick as fleas on a stray hound dog and had been roaming the North American continent for centuries, numbering in the tens of millions. For centuries, Native Americans had relied on the buffalo as their primary resource for food, shelter, clothing, and tools. To the Native Americans, the buffalo represented the sustaining of life in addition to the trait of humbleness. The buffalo symbol is a reminder to take only what one needs. In addition to the 17 states that had been granted statehood and newly formed territories on the brink of birthing more new states, the remaining parts of the country were mostly unexplored and were still under the control of Great Britain in the Northwest and Spain in the Southeast and Southwest. By 1810, the seas of war had once again been sown leading to the entanglement in yet another war with Great Britain, some 30 years after the end of the Revolutionary War. It was the War of 1812. From Studio 37, welcome to the Man and Perrin Families of Western Iowa YouTube channel. I'm your host, writer and producer, Brian Mann, and this is Episode 3, 1810 to 1820. This is the third episode of an 11-part video series about the man and parent families who settled in the Lust Hills of Western Iowa in the mid-1800s. My apologies for the long delay in getting this episode published. I took some time off these past few weeks to spend some quality time with my dad, Dwayne Mann, up in Woodbine, Iowa. But now, Elaine and I are back at it and we are excited to present the next episode in our Man and Parent Families Ancestry video series. To kick things off, Elena is going to summarily explain how and when the national census was conducted in the early 19th century, and leave you with some things to ponder regarding the accuracy of some of the information that was recorded back then. The Authorization Act for the Third U.S. Census, the Census of 1810, stipulated that an assistant marshal must actually visit each household or the head of each family within his designated district and should not rely on hearsay or the like to complete his count. The act also mandated that the enumeration commence on the first Monday of August. In 1810, census counting began on August the 6th. If you have become a genealogy enthusiast, you may have experienced the excitement of finding that first census document listing one of your ancestors. It truly is an exciting moment, but after the discovery of the second and many more census documents, coupled with your natural tendency to do the math, you will invariably encounter some information that leaves you scratching your head. For the most part, what you find on these documents is accurate and reliable, but sometimes there are mistakes. Why? because of the human factor. 
The new stipulation in 1810 that an assistant marshal must be assigned to the task of gathering census information meant that the actual, full-time town marshals most likely deputized several men, as many as they could afford, to spread out and complete the task at hand. The census takers back then had only two modes of transportation available, by foot or by horse, either on a horse or behind a horse. This naturally took several weeks, if not months, to complete, which is why the census began on the first Monday in August. They would have the remaining weeks of the summer and into the fall to visit each family in their district and ask the residents the basic census questions. It was probably most desirable to ensure the men being deputized possessed some minimal level of essential literary capabilities because the job required writing down what people had told them and what they thought they heard. Most of the rural people they encountered were probably illiterate, so they had no way to verify what was written down on their behalf. In addition, birth dates were seldom important unless your family was well off, so most relied on memories. These are just some of the things to keep in mind when you come across census documents or any other old document for that matter. In the upcoming episode 7, 1850 to 1860, we will share evidence of the human factor we've encountered on an 1850 and 1851 census document and one other legal document we discovered several years ago. By midsummer in 1810, the Geographic Center of the United States population listed as 7,239,881 was only 40 miles northwest of Washington, D.C. in the state of Virginia. On the 1810 census conducted in Hebron County, New York, my fourth great-grandfather, Ephraim Perrin, is listed as the head of his family. Counts for his family show himself, one tick mark, under the free white male 26 to 44 range, he would have been 27 or 28 years old, and his wife, Hannah, one tick mark, under the free white female 26 to 44 range, she would have been about 26 at the time. In addition, two free white males under the age of 10 are noted, along with one free white female under the age of 10. We believe the three toddlers are Ephraim and Hannah's children, Nathan, Armin, and Eliza, respectively. I have been unable to find an 1810 census listing my third great-grandfather, Nathaniel Mann. However, on the 1810 census conducted in Wyndham County, Vermont, I do find Nathaniel's younger brother, Stephen, listed as the head of family on the census for the town of Dummerston. It's likely that Nathaniel and my third great-grandmother, Mary Eunice, were living with Stephen at the time the census was taken. Stephen and his wife are both listed, noted by the number one under the 26 through 44 age range for both free white males and females. Stephen and his wife had three daughters at that time, two under the age of 10 and one daughter between 10 and 15. There is also one person listed under the 45 and over age range for both free white males and females, and we believe these counts are from Nathaniel and Mary. In addition, there are two free white male children under the age of 10 listed. These would be my second great-grandfather, Richard Montgomery Mann, who would have been seven years old at the time, and his older brother John Mann, who was nine years old in 1810. On September 8th, 1810, 33 employees of the Pacific Fur Company, founded by John Jacob Astor in June of that year, set sail from New York Harbor aboard the ship Tonquin. They embarked on a six-month journey around South America, arriving at the mouth of the Columbia River in present-day Oregon, and founded the fur trading town of Astoria. Construction of Fort Astoria completed in 1811 and was used as their base of operations. Later that year, off the shore of Vancouver Island, the company vessel Tonquin, along with the majority of the annual trading goods, was destroyed. On November 7, 1811, the Battle of Tippecanoe took place near the confluence of the Wabash and Tippecanoe Rivers at Battleground, Indiana. American forces were led by then-Governor William Henry Harrison, and the Native American Shawnee leader Tecumseh and his brother Tinsquatawa, known as the Prophet, 
led a confederacy of various tribes who opposed European-American settlement of the American frontier. An American army of around 1,000 men attacked the Confederate tribe's headquarters at the village known then as Prophetstown. Tecumseh, not yet prepared to oppose the United States by force, was away recruiting allied tribes when Harrison's army arrived. Tinsquatawa was left in charge, but he was a spiritual leader and not a military man. On the morning of November 7th, Prophetstown warriors attacked Harrison's army and took them by surprise. For more than two hours, Harrison's army stood their ground. After the battle, they burned Prophetstown to the ground and destroyed their food supplies for the winter. On April 12, 1812, my third great-grandfather, Charles Chauncey Perrin, was born in Granville, New York. Charles was the fourth of 11 children born to Ephraim and Hannah Perrin. On June 1, 1812, President James Madison asked Congress to declare war on the United Kingdom. Before the vote could be approved, British ships raised a blockade against the United States on June 16th. Although unaware of the blockade at the time, Madison signed the declaration after Congress narrowly approves the war with Great Britain. Western states generally favored the action, while New England states disapproved, including Rhode Island, which refused to participate in the war. The seeds of war were sown in 1810, when 4,000 naturalized American sailors had been seized by British forces, forcing trade between England and the United States to grind to a halt. The declaration of war on Britain was over British interference with American maritime shipping and westward expansion. During the fall of 1812, President James Madison defeated DeWitt Clinton in the U.S. presidential election by an electoral college margin of 128 votes to 89, securing a second term as the War of 1812 raged on. James Madison was inaugurated for his second term as president on March 4, 1813. The Pacific Northwest was an area contested over the preceding decades between Ireland and Great Britain, the Spanish, the United States, and the Russian Empire. Competition with other newly formed fur companies began soon after the construction of Fort Astoria. The lack of military protection during the War of 1812 forced the sale of the Pacific Fur Company, rendering it functionally defunct by 1813. As fate would have it, a party of historians returning overland to St. Louis in 1813 made the important discovery of the South Pass through the Rocky Mountains in present-day central Wyoming. This geographic discovery would later be used by thousands of settlers traveling over the Oregon, California, and Mormon trails. My second great-grandfathers, Charles Chauncey Perrin and Richard Montgomery Mann, traversed the Glory Road in 1848, 1852, and 1859. At the age of 29, Ephraim Perrin, my fourth great-grandfather, served as a private in the 50th Regiment of the New York Militia during the War of 1812. We don't know a lot about this regiment, but we know that George McClure was the American Brigadier General in Command. There was one infamous battle that took place on December 10, 1813, that triggered events that would forever leave a black mark on the 50th Regiment of the New York Militia. On that day, General McClure and his armed militia abandoned the recently captured British Fort George in Newark, Niagara-on-the-Lake, and then, for reasons no one on either side of the conflict could then or now fathom, he ordered the British village of Newark burned. The weather was snowy and frigid that day, and the action rendered the Canadian citizens homeless. When residents in the U.S. learned of this, they feared retaliation by the British. It was not long in coming. Nine days later, on December 19th, the British crossed the Niagara River at Fort Niagara and captured it quickly. When Lewiston was burned the same day, the alarm went out as far as Avon and Caledonia on the east, all the way to Chautauqua in the south. Males over age 16 were drafted, called up to serve in the state militia. All units gravitated to the Niagara frontier, 
especially Black Rock and Buffalo. Both towns, along with every settlement along the Niagara River from Lewiston South, were burnt to the ground by the British in retaliation for burning of Newark by the Americans. The extent of Ephraim's involvement in these events, if any, is a mystery to us. On August 24th, 1814, British troops captured Washington, D.C. and set fire to the White House and Capitol. This act, in retaliation for the destruction by U.S. troops of Canadian public buildings, caused President Madison to evacuate. The British advance was halted by Maryland militia three weeks later on September 12th. Another United States president, James Monroe, would have to wait three years before he could reoccupy the executive mansion. On December 24, 1814, a peace treaty, the Treaty of Ghent, is signed between the British and American governments, officially bringing to an end the War of 1812. On the Calmette Plantation at New Orleans on January 8, 1815, 5,300 British troops under the command of Sir Edward Pakenham, still unaware of the peace treaty signed two weeks earlier, attacked American forces in the last battle of the War of 1812. Major General Andrew Jackson led his American soldiers to victory over the British troops, who took over 2,000 casualties compared to only 71 Americans lost. Volcanic ash from the Mount Tambor eruption on April 10, 1815, in present-day Indonesia, dispersed around the world and lowered the global temperatures, causing an event known as the year without a summer in 1816. The brief period of significant climate change triggered extreme weather and harvest failures in many parts of the world. Between November 1st and December 4th, 1816, James Monroe defeated Rufus King in the U.S. presidential election, garnering 183 electoral college votes to 34 for the Federalist King. On March 4, 1817, James Monroe was inaugurated as the fifth president of the United States, succeeding James Madison. His vice president, Daniel Tompkins, who would serve alongside Monroe for his entire eight years, was also inaugurated. On June 4, 1817, the construction of the Erie Canal began at Rome, New York. The first section between Rome and Utica was completed two years later. The canal would eventually connect the Atlantic Ocean through the Hudson River to the Great Lakes with 83 locks over its 363-mile course. When completed in 1825, the canal cut transportation costs by 90%. On March 15, 1818, Andrew Jackson and his American army invaded Florida in the Seminole War, causing repercussions with Spain as negotiations to purchase the territory had just begun. On April 4, 1818, the very day my second great-grandfather, Richard Montgomery Mann, turned 15 years of age, the flag of the United States is officially adopted by Congress with a configuration of 13 red and white stripes and one star for each state in the Union. At the time of adoption, with the most recent addition of Mississippi, the flag had 20 stars. On October 20, 1818, the northern boundary of the United States and Canada was established between the U.S. and United Kingdom. Its location from the Lake of the Woods to the Rocky Mountains would be the 49th parallel. On February 15, 1819, the Talmadge Amendment was passed by the U.S. House of Representatives, stating that slaves would be barred in the new state of Missouri, which became the opening vote in the Missouri Compromise controversy. A week later, on February 22, 1819, the territory of Florida is ceded to the United States by Spain in the adams onis Treaty. Between February 2nd and March 3rd, 1819, the landmark Supreme Court case, McCulloch v. Maryland, was argued. The case was decided on March 6th, which upheld the right of Congress to establish a national bank, a power implied but not specifically enumerated by the Constitution. 
By the end of the year 1819, five more states were added to the Union. Louisiana became the 18th state on April 30, 1812. Indiana was admitted as the 19th state on December 11, 1816. Mississippi became the 20th state on December 10, 1817. Illinois was admitted to the Union on December 3, 1818 as the 21st state, and Alabama became the 22nd state on December 14, 1819. This concludes Episode 3, 1810 to 1820, of the Man and Parent Families of Western Iowa Ancestry video series. I know we threw a lot of national history events at you once again. In a couple more episodes, things will start to balance out as we begin to share much more information about the mans and the parents. We hope that you are enjoying these episodes and would love to hear from you. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or bits and pieces of information you'd like to share to fill in some of the gaps. We've included our email address in the description below. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on that notifications button to be notified when new episodes are published. Stay tuned for episode four, 1820 to 1830. We'll be publishing that episode within the next couple of weeks. With that, kind regards and thanks for watching. See you next time, bye. Thank you.